This is Jonathan Ferguson, Keeper of Firearms and Artillery at the Royal Armouries Museum in the UK, which houses a collection of thousands of iconic weapons from throughout history. And today he's returning to Valve's legendary shooter franchise, Counter-Strike, to check out more of the series' iconic firearms. Hmm, okay, so the, the CSGO version of the Deagle is looking pretty good, but the first thing I notice is the, the markings, which are basically real rather than legally different, are mirrored onto the other side of the slide, which is a little curious. If you're a fan of Counter-Strike, make sure to check out our previous episode on the franchise, and if there are any other games, guns, or mechanics that you guys want to see Jonathan break down, let us know in the comments section below. Right, over to Jonathan. Revolvers. Gotta have a revolver in... Well, any game descended from Half-Life needs to have a Magnum revolver, in my view, regardless of how realistic that is. Uh, and of course, we've got one faction who can basically, in theory, buy whatever weapons they want, so... What the heck? The latest version of Counter-Strike has a modernised revolver with a Picatinny rail on the top. Well, not really a muzzle weight. Again, it's a rail adapter on the front. This is one of the Smith & Wesson Performance Center models based on the old school uh, series of revolver frames. Those haven't really changed, but the, the barrel profile, the ability to mount uh, red dot sights on there. Once upon a time, you'd have needed a custom mount to achieve that. And with modern revolvers, this type of revolver anyway, uh, you have a standard Picatinny rail on the top, which changes up the looks for the player as well and lets you use a scope. There's always been something about a scoped revolver. Again, thinking back to that Half-Life Magnum. That was quite the revelation in 1998. The fanning of the hammer. Not really necessary. It's a double action revolver, as Shah has demonstrated in the animation, with a, a weirdly sort of clockworky, ratchety sound, which you wouldn't normally hear. I'd worry if you could hear the lockwork of a revolver clacketing away as you pull the trigger. Uh, I mean, if you put your ear next to it, you'll hear it. But. Uh, speaking of putting guns near your head, um, <laughs> spinning it around the finger. Not recommended. Not only is it sort of pointless, and the risk is you drop the thing, but. Uh, Spinning it in that way means you're pointing the thing at yourself whilst putting pressure on the trigger. And if you were stupid enough to do it, sorry, extra stupid enough to do it, with the hammer cocked in single action mode, well, you've got a very good chance of shooting yourself. Or at least someone behind you. But I understand the impulse to depict a revolver in Old West style. If you're going to do that though, I probably would have gone for something like a uh, Red Hawk or you know, some modern Magnum take, or BFR maybe. Uh, mag modern Magnum take on the old school single action army and then the fanning would be worthwhile it would look very cool and spinning it around the finger would be a bit safer in theory I know it's a game you're not going to hurt yourself but <laughs> ah yes the trademark fingerless gloves and impeccable manicure of a terrorist so we have two variants of the uh, IMI or IWI Galil here. The first one brings back very fond memories of back when I played Counter-Strike, which was pre-Go. So that was the, the old school Galil, uh, which I've hastily grabbed an example of from the collection. It happens to be a self-loading variant, but it's in Counter-Strike trim, if you like. Of course, we've got our mirrored issue with Counter-Strike that we've covered before. When we get to Global Offensive, though, that's been fixed, and so has the Galil. <laughs> because by this point, the Galil has a left side cocking handle in its ACE configuration, which is the version that they've moved to in the modern iteration of the game. More Picatinny rails, more ergonomics, including left side cocking handle with a sort of spring-loaded dust cover that gets barged out of the way by the cocking handle. Not, in theory, ideal, opening up the receiver to dirt and debris, but in theory, the, uh, the cover will, will protect it and it means you don't have to flip the rifle over. Mind you, the Galil was probably wrong on this, but <laughs> off the cuff, the first AK derivative to have such an easily grasped over the top cocking handle. It's not actually a problem to operate the cocking handle from the left side. The rate of fire on the, on the original is astonishingly high. Um, I haven't fired bursts from a Galil, but it seems far too high to the point where the sound effects fall over themselves. So even, even playing it as a <clears throat> younger person struck me as uh, a bit too bit too high um, much slower with the ACE I don't know if they may have overcorrected there but um, anyway uh, 
MP5s. Gotta love MP5s. This one is, it might be my sound system here, but a bit too bassy, a bit too machine gunny. It's a difficult one to, to get right because you don't want it like the original Half-Life MP5, which was amazing for the time, don't get me wrong, but sounded a bit like a sort of sewing machine. This is maybe too much like, I don't know, it almost sounds like a 50 cal machine gun or something, albeit at a MP5 appropriate rate of fire. I do like the CSGO write-up for the MP5. Often imitated, but never equaled. I'm sure some people would argue with that, but uh, it'll always be the best submachine gun in my book. The, the write-up for this gun said it was whisper quiet. And, um, well, I think that would be hyperbole at the best of times, but even in the game it's not. It's, it's still quite loud and punchy. And if you're ever going to depict a gun as quietly clack clacketing away to itself, it would be the MP5 SD. That integrated suppressor and, uh, well, just makes the round subsonic, as we've commented here before. And almost all you can hear really is the bolt clattering back and forth. There will be a, a small pop at the end of the suppressor as well, but it is very, very quiet. Whisper quiet? Maybe not. But quieter than this, I would suggest. Another staple of classic Counter-Strike, the uh, SG-552. Uh, but we do have a bona fide 552. Uh, 552 dash 2 commando to be precise which i believe is the version of the 552 that counter-strike was depicting very short barrel this uh trumpet four prong flash hider i think is what's on there as well yeah the only difference is it's depicted here with a rail on the upper uh, and there is a rail later railed version of it we have the old school 70s, 80s one. In fact, this example is serial number 207, 0207. So, in the scheme of things, pretty early. Not, not a very common weapon to be depicted in games, um, but quite a cool one. Now, we, we recently did another series of guns from the game Squad, and there was an FN Minimi in that. Uh, this being an M249 US service version of the Minimi, it's the same gun. And I, I said at the time that most video games that, that adapt the Minimi treat it as a sort of Rambo gun and it's just like a very... Like, a, like an assault rifle on steroids, really. Not sort of depicted like a true light machine gun would be. Uh, which Squad did do. Well, here we are, <laughs> as if to prove my point, here is your classic generic video game LMG, often based on the on the Minimi, as this one is. You know, nicely modelled for the for the technology level that we're talking about. Can't fault it too much, except that the it's missing the two catches or that you pinch at the back to lift the top cover open. This guy just rips the top cover open <laughs> and slams it shut and it stays shut. The rate of fire is there, the portability is there. Can't really fault it within the confines of Counter-Strike, but it does nicely contrast with how the Minimi is depicted in a game like Squad. The second time I've seen my mug sprayed onto the wall of a, of a video game. Thanks, I guess. <laughs> so we're looking at the CSGO model here, improved in, in various aspects. The barrel looks a little skinny, maybe. Uh, we've got some wear overall that looks pretty good. It's definitely, uh, clearly, much more detailed than the original couple of incarnations. What we do get though in the reload animation, because this version of the game correctly tracks ammunition, is we see the weapon getting cocked, which wouldn't happen in the first two versions of Counter-Strike because it doesn't track ammunition in that way. Either the weapon is always cocked when you change magazines, or it's not cocked at all because it never reaches that point, I suppose.
Wow, I'd forgotten how um, shotguns in Counter-Strike kind of sound like artillery pieces relative to everything else. Real sort of thunderous rolling boom going on there. Not particularly like a real shotgun, but <laughs> but kind of impressive. So this is this uh, Benelli Super 90, so it'll be... It would be an M4 Super 90, I believe, but the shape of the receiver is quite strange. I don't know if that's some real-world world modification that I'm not familiar with, or if they've just changed up the design, I don't know. But that big lug on the bottom of the receiver is what's throwing me off. And it's still flipped, so it's uh, ejecting its empties to the left, the cocking handle is on the left. But hey, it's a semi-automatic shotgun, does the job. So this Counter-Strike Source version of the FAMAS got me thinking because my first thought was, oh, that doesn't look quite right for a FAMAS. But I think what I'm seeing is a very good effort within the Source engine to replicate the actual FAMAS. The problem for them was how rounded a lot of the contours on this rifle actually are. It's actually quite sort of smooth and melty looking. <laughs> Um, look at it up close, whereas the, the model has a lot of very straight edges on it and is somewhat simplified. So I think they've, they've looked at all the right cues, as it were, but the end result ends up looking wrong because there isn't the curvature, there aren't the, there aren't the constant curves uh, to depict. I'll try and show you what I mean. So fold the, fold, we fold down one of the bipod legs. This angle here and here, this is all very smooth and, and flowing into the lines of the rifle, whereas the 3D model is <laughs> with very crisp edges that just don't exist on the real object. Three to go. Right, um, good effort on the Deagle, I think. Lots of nice shine on there. Uh, proportions look good. The way it handles, it, re it recoils perhaps roughly what you would expect for a, a big ball pistol like this. It does, however, suffer from what I'm now going to, from what I'm now dubbing automatic slide lock syndrome, ASLS, uh, <laughs> in which no matter what the state of the weapon, when you go to reload it, the slide magically goes to the rear. We've seen this before. We probably won't see it again. Not at least. Not for games post-dating 2022, I would hope. Bit of a shortcut in the reload animation process, I guess. And only something that gun nerds would notice, and there were fewer of us back then. <laughs>Hmm, okay, so the, the CSGO version of the Deagle is looking pretty good, but the first thing I notice is the the markings, which are basically real rather than legally different, are mirrored onto the other side of the slide, which is a little curious. We've got a lot of straight edges on this as well, but overall, you know, it's, it's recognisably the Desert Eagle. To be fair, the real thing also has a lot of straight edges on it. <laughs> Funnily enough, I wonder if the earlier Desert Eagle was actually a bit small proportionally, because this looks better, this looks more realistic. And sure enough, we have that modern thumbs forward grip. Extra important with the Desert Eagle, because the recoil is significant. And if you jack bow a teacup that thing, your, your grip is rubbish. Um, <laughs> not recommended. We've also got the um, over the top cocking action, if you like, rather than the slide release. It's funny how fashion dictates some of this stuff. That style of pull back, slide and release was popularized by the Magpul guys, God, a decade ago or so, uh, and it's still used today. It does have the advantage that you can operate any self-loading pistol using that without having to know where the slide release is located necessarily, if it's a totally new pistol to you, and you don't have to sort of awkwardly reach for it and apply the right amount of pressure. The slide release on the Desert Eagle requires a lot of thumb pressure to release. So the reliable, consistent way to release a slide from slide lock, having replaced the magazine of course, otherwise it's not going anywhere, is that over the top grasp.
Right, 5-7. Um, I didn't remember this being an old school Counter-Strike, but I spent most of my time pre-1.6. That's how old I am. So, <laughs> not the greatest looking video game gun ever. I think the limitations of the graphics engine are just too much for the complexity of this design. Um, lots of edges and curves and angles and fine details. And by attempting to depict them, it comes off looking very busy and almost misshapen. It's like the it's too narrow, the, the reload, it's like they're trying to jam a magazine that's too big for the gun into the grip, which to be fair, isn't far off. The, the magazine on the 5.7 is almost as wide front to back as the gun is, um, but it's almost clipping through the gun. I'm now looking at the CSGO version and needless to say, two generations on, things have improved greatly. I can nitpick, nitpick this thing uh, if we had the time. The checkering on the on the front strap isn't quite right. Some of the angles aren't quite right. I'm, I'm not going to go to town on it. It's recognisably an FN 5.7. Right, MP7. Um, now the one I've grabbed is a, an ex-police model, so as well as some rack numbers it has only semi-automatic, as UK police do not use automatic fire. Now there are a couple of different flavours of MP7 floating around, um, so we allow a little bit of artistic licence depending on whether it's a, an early A1, a later A1 or an A2. But there are, yeah, there are a few minor issues with this. The way that the front grip is depicted it should hinge higher up on that mounting lug. There is a weird hole underneath the fire selector. So when I move that, there should be solid polymer there. On this model, there's what looks like a hole through the receiver, which doesn't quite look right. Anyway, we could, we could go on. Let's see how it plays. Yeah, I mean, proportionately compared to the other guns in the game, it behaves as you'd expect. Sounds a bit muffled, muted, almost like it's suppressed, but it isn't. The cartridge cases flying out look to be standard pistol cases, not the 5.7 case that it should be. And it's a little bit too controllable considering that the stock is never extended. It's, all, it's almost, it shoots pretty much like the stock is in the shoulder, which it isn't. You have done win. Only three more. Right, G3 SG1. I have one here, um, or at least G3SG1 configuration, which is one of several accurized H&K G3 rifles. Buttstock with a cheek piece, claw mount for a relatively high power scope. This one is actually marked up as something else, G3FS. I think it may have been built as an SG1 latterly. We do have a, a gun marked G3SG1 in the Royal Armouries collection, but it doesn't have a scope and a mount. So I grabbed this for you. Only real thing to say, it kind of functions as a, as a semi-auto sniper, or really what it is, more than a DMR. Pretty much functions as you'd expect. I don't know why they went to green furniture, because I've never seen one of these with green furniture. But you could, you could find a set of green furniture and change it out, I guess. Although the stock is sort of specific to this. It's, it's kind of hard to, to criticise beyond that. It, it, within the limitations of the game, it works as it, as it should, I think it's safe to say. Uh, which is to say, you can use it like a battle rifle, semi-automatic from the, from the hip, because you kind of have to do one or the other. There's no backup sights to let you use it like a more powerful close quarters rifle, as it were. And then you zoom to the scope for longer distance. Absolutely standard game stuff. Okay, we've got a bit of a funky looking AR-15 here. The proportions don't look right. Buffer tube is too small, the lower receiver is an odd shape, especially the fence, as we call it, around the, the magazine catch is a bit odd looking. Dust cover is just flat, which is weird, normally there's a texture on that. The receiver is too deep at the back. <laughs> Pistol grip's an odd shape, there's, I don't know what's going on with the selector there. The Handguard looks like one version of, a, of the AR-15 or M4 handguard. There aren't any grooves seemingly in the Picatinny rail on the top. And the flash hider doesn't look quite right either. Yeah, it's all a little bit out of whack. The buttstock itself, compared to the buffer tube, is huge. Yeah, not the most successful rendition I've ever seen. An M4A4? Well, there isn't an M4A4. Um, let's see. 
Okay, we've got a good reload there. The drop the magazine free, insert new one, slap the bolt release, that's all good. The selector on the left hand side is correct. It's the weird black empty thing on the right that I don't understand, that almost looks like a mistake. Uh, and I can now see the, the stop bridges on the Picatinny rail, so that must have been the, the angle that I was looking at. Yeah, it may be a bit generic as video game guns go, but then hey, the AR-15 is generic as real guns go. As always, if you'd like to donate to us, you can do that via the description. Otherwise, check out our various Royal Armoury social media platforms, the websites, and ideally, if you can, the museums as well. They're well worth a look. See you next week, guys.